What's up guys, my name is Grant Collins. I'm a cybersecurity student who recently just completed a introduction to Linux for cybersecurity project. In this project, I learned uh, specifically how to use some basic functionalities with the command line, and I applied my basic understanding of the command line with some security type projects. I decided to go ahead and make a crash course to pay the knowledge forward and just to describe what I have learned. I will be walking through uh, what I've learned throughout the, the introduction to Linux course, and I will also be completing one of my basic projects, which is configuring a web server uh, with IP tables. So grab a coffee, get your laptop, and let's start learning Linux. Let's start learning Linux, starting with the crash course overview. What's up guys, it's Grant here. Hope all is well. Welcome to the Linux for cybersecurity crash course. I will be doing a quick overview before we dive into the material. So in this crash course, we will be doing a basic introduction to Linux, what it is, and because this is specifically geared towards cybersecurity, we will be naming some cybersecurity use cases, including the Linux distributions that we will be using for this crash course, and when it comes to choosing a beginner-friendly distribution, the ones that I recommend. We will then move on to installing VirtualBox, installing Ubuntu, and mounting Ubuntu to the new VM, and configuring Ubuntu. After that, we will be diving into the terminal in terms of the shell, learning about the Linux directory structure, basic Linux commands, how we can find command help, working with directories, listing files, understanding file permissions, changing file permissions, finding files and directories, viewing and editing files, archiving, input, output, and standard error redirection. We will be looking at how to search for patterns, pipes, environmental variables, basic process controls, creating and switching users, and finally to end it, installing software. To conclude our learning, we will be going through the IP tables project that I worked with in terms of configuring a basic web server, opening up different ports, blocking ports, and IP addresses. Make sure to go get your free copy of the complete notes for this crash course. I have included every single thing in here, including the different types of commands and just everything. Uh, it is completely free to download on the Cyber Academy website. So go ahead and download those if you're looking for some introduction to Linux notes. So we have a lot to learn and let's go ahead and dive in to an introduction to Linux. To start off this Linux crash course, let's go ahead and define what the heck Linux is. For most of you, Linux, as you know, is an operating system. And it is a kernel which sits between the hardware and the software. It was created by Linus Trevalds in 1991, and version 1.0 was released in 1994. Linux is known as FOSS, or Free Open Source Software. So thousands upon thousands of people have contributed to Linux. And Linux has many types of distribution, and each distribution has a different focus. Many distributions are available to choose from, and you can go see all the types of distributions at distrowatch.com. So why learn Linux? Well, Linux runs on all kinds of hardware platforms. It's known for being very stable, reliable, and secure, and it makes for a great server uh, architecture or operating system. Linux is free, and you don't have to buy the license fee for anything. Most of the software in Linux is free as well. What is a Linux distribution? Well, the kernel is the core, and every distribution has a Linux kernel. A Linux kernel plus specific applications make a distribution. Two of the most popular distributions are Red Hat and Ubuntu, the OS we will be using. So Linux is used in multiple different ways. And for cybersecurity, we have uh, specific ways that it is used. If you are wanting to learn a little bit more about the specific use cases, there is an article in the link in the description below that I wrote 
that you can learn a little bit more about the specific use cases. But here I'm gonna give just a brief overview. So Linux is used for specialized distributions as we talked about, such as Kali Linux. And Kali Linux is used by cyber professionals to perform penetration tests, uh, vulnerability scans, Linux is commonly used on various types of network and security devices like routers, firewalls, virtual private networks, intrusion detection systems, security information and event management systems, and much more. Linux is also open source, meaning anyone can contribute within the community towards a specific tool or functionality. Uh, so open source tools are commonly used within the industry, and specifically for cybersecurity, we have open source tools like the Metasploit framework, OpenSSH, and MMAP. Um, so there is many types of open source tools that are used in the security industry. So that's basically why we use Linux in the first place when it comes to cybersecurity. And there is other use cases, but these are the primary reasons why. Now, debating on which Linux distribution to use is not going to be the most efficient use of your time. You have many options to choose from, and I would recommend choosing a distribution which is novice friendly, popular, and supported. Choosing a beginner friendly distribution will have many benefits. If you choose a distribution such as Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Elementary OS, or Debian, you will be able to navigate and utilize Linux more efficiently, and then you can transition into the distribution that you're interested in. In the Ultimate Linux Mastery Bundle on Station X, and uh, this crash course is inspired by this bundle, we used CentOS, which was based off of the Red Hat Linux. Any of the mentioned distributions are great to start out with, and the specific distribution doesn't matter. In this crash course, we will be using Ubuntu. So let's go ahead and switch over to the desktop so we can start with VirtualBox. Before we get started with Linux, specifically we will be using the distribution Ubuntu, we first have to install a hypervisor. Now, for those of you who don't know what a hypervisor is, it can either be computer software, firmware, or hardware that creates and runs virtual machines on our host device. So Think of the hypervisor as a way for you to create virtual machines so that you can interact and learn Linux or interact with different VMs, whether that be Windows 10 or Windows XP or any other Linux distribution. So we will be installing a free hypervisor created by Oracle called Oracle VirtualBox. To install Oracle VirtualBox, please go to just the link that I'm about to paste and go if I had it. Eh. Just go to virtualbox.org in the download section and download the specific host that you have. For most of you, that will be Windows, I suspect, but they also have a Mac version. So go ahead and click Windows and click Save File. Wait for this to download. After this has downloaded, you will most likely see this in your Downloads folder. Go ahead and double click to bring up the wizard. Now, I already have VirtualBox installed, but basically all you are going to do is run through all the defaults and make sure to create a desktop icon shortcut so that you, it's pretty convenient and easy to use. So just go through all the wizard in the defaults. There is notes in the description below for those of you who want specific details. Once you have installed and gone through the default wizard, you will most likely see a Oracle VM VirtualBox icon and you basically double click and you will have your hypervisor installed. Now, for those of you who don't have VirtualBox installed and have never used VMs before, you will never see any of these VMs and we will be installing the Ubuntu VM today, but you can install all kinds of VMs. So don't worry, you don't, we won't see this. You'll just see a blank screen. Now that we have VirtualBox installed, our next task is to create our first VM. Uh, for this specific VM, we are going to be using Ubuntu. So we are going to go back to our browser, and this time, unlike last time, I have the download link copied, which is just basically Ubuntu.com download, and we are going to be downloading the latest version. So all you have to do is click download, wait for your download to pop up, and click OK. Once the Ubuntu ISO has finished installing, and it may take a few minutes because it's a little bit over a gigabyte, uh, make sure and verify that it is in your downloads folder or wherever you downloaded it, just to make sure so that when we're creating our VM, we don't have to worry about it. 
So we're going to go back to VirtualBox and we're going to click New. And you can name this whatever you want to. I'm going to be just creating this as Ubuntu and it automatically fills out the type and version. Click Next. This is where you can allocate the number of or the amount of memory. I have on my notes, I have a specific table for you if you want just a quick conversion. So um, for me, I'm just going to use 2048 or 2 gigabytes. I do whatever you want to. Click Next. You are going to create a virtual hard disk, so click Create. Make sure to click VDI or VirtualBox Disk Image. Click Next. Now, there is two ways you can go about creating your virtual disk for the storage. Uh, I recommend you use dynamically allocated. So you're going to have a set amount of gigabytes that you allocate towards this VM, but it will grow as you store more files on it. Whereas uh, in a fixed size setup, all you're going to do is just set the, uh, um, the maximum number amount of storage on your hardware. So just click dynamically allocated for the best possible storage. Uh, for this, it recommends 10 gigabytes, and I would just click Create. So now we have our Ubuntu VM created, and all we have to do is mount our ISO file. So we're going to go ahead and go up here and click Settings. Go to Storage and click this CD icon. Click Choose Disk. You won't see these up here, so don't worry about that. Uh, you're just going to click Add and you're gonna to go to your downloads folder where you have your Ubuntu installed and click open and you're good to go. Once you have that done, you can click okay and you are good to go. So go ahead and start up the Ubuntu VM. And as you can see, Ubuntu will load up and it will get us to our configuration screen. Once Ubuntu has fully loaded you will see this configuration wizard. Now you can try Ubuntu with a live version, basically meaning nothing will save, just a live version. Uh, but we are going to install Ubuntu on this VM. So go ahead, click Install Ubuntu. Choose your language, click Continue. We are going to select Normal Installation and we are going to download updates while installing Ubuntu. Choose the default option, erase disk, and install Ubuntu. Don't worry, it's just talking about the VM, not, not like your actual host machine. So click Install Now. You will see this partition warning box, and go ahead and click Continue. We select your region or time zone, so I am in U.S. Central Time. Click Continue and create our user profile. So for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to use my name as my username and a very insecure password root. And now we are going to wait for Ubuntu to fully install. So just give this some time. You will now have the login prompt, which you can put in your password and you will be sent to the home screen of Ubuntu. So congratulations, you just installed your first VM. Maybe. Please just show the desktop. Yes, we did it. The desktop. A common question asked is how we can full screen this VM. To do this, all we need to do is go to Devices, Insert Guest Editions CD Image. Click Run and authenticate with your password. A command prompt will pop up. Press Return. And now we can full screen by either maximizing our window or clicking our host key, which would be down here, and F. Click Switch. And we will now have a fully screened Ubuntu desktop. To download the exercise files so that you can follow along in this crash course, go to the following Google Drive link and click Download All. Save the file and go to the Files section, Downloads, 
you will have this introduction for cybersecurity zip. Go ahead, right click, extract here, and go ahead and drag and drop this onto your desktop. Now open up the introduction to Linux for cybersecurity. Double click and you will see a folder called my favorite company and you can drop this also onto your desktop if it didn't do that there. <laughs> so now you have the introduction and you have my favorite company. You can delete this if you want. I'm just going to keep it for now. Close out of all of your tabs. And now you have the exercise files. The command line, also known as the terminal, is what makes Linux powerful. The power of Linux resides in how well you're going to be able to use and navigate the terminal. And you're going to be using this almost every single time you want to do something internally within the OS. So there are a few ways to open a terminal. The first way is to simply right click and click open terminal. The second way is to go down to your search bar with show applications, type in terminal, open the terminal program. This shell is nothing more than a program which accepts your commands and executes those commands. This is also known as a command line interpreter. The command line is powerful and it will always be here. So when you're configuring routers, firewalls, you're going to be using the command line. Right now, I am considered a normal user denoted by the dollar sign. I have changed my user account to root and we can determine that this is root based off of the hashtag sign. So anything can be done by root, whereas normal users will have limited permissions. By convention, only execute commands with root or sudo privileges so that you do not have to switch to the root account. And day-to-day -day activities should be performed using a normal account. Linux directories are commonly known as folders to the average computer user. So in Linux, we call these directories. There are many types of directories. There's all kinds of directories in Linux. And there's many default directories that you can use. Uh, so here are some of the most popular ones that are being populated on the screen. I have navigated to my user bin and created a new directory called Adobe. Now, don't worry about this. We will learn how to navigate and make new directories. All I want to show you is that when we are navigating directories, the parent directory is considered to be the leftmost directory. So this user would be considered the parent directory. And the child directory of this user directory is Adobe. So when you hear the words parent and child directory, we're referring to a hierarchical structure where uh, directories refer to one another. So this would be the parents and this would be the child. When navigating through the terminal, there are quite a few commands that you can perform. Now, you're going to be able to learn a ton of commands when you start using Linux, but what I'm going to show you right now is the most common commands that you will use on the daily, the ones that you'll use basically every single time you're navigating through the terminal. So let's go ahead and open up a new terminal session. So to start off our daily commands, or the commands that we will use on a very common basis, we are going to start with the ls command, which stands for list directories. So if we perform ls, you will see all of our directories and folders and files that you would have when you list. So right now I'm in my home directory, and these are all of the directories that are shown. And just to reference this, we can go up to our files section, and you can see that you have the desktop, documents, downloads, all of this, all of these directories uh, are shown here. So the ls command is used to list files and directories. Our next command is cd for change directory. So if we perform a cd desktop, we will change our directory to the desktop. And then we can perform an ls command to see what's on our desktop.
So right now we have our zip folder, our exercise files on our desktop as you can see here. Now let's say you want to go back. All you have to do is click, not click, don't click, do but type cd dot dot space dot dot and you will go back a directory. So now if we do an ls again, we are back to where we first started out. Now let's go ahead and go to our desktop if I can spell. And then let's go to uh, our, let's just go to my favorite company. Um, so uh, one way that you can really quickly type through these is just to, to type in the first maybe two or three letters and then use tab completion and you will be able to have the directory populated so you don't have to type in all of this. So click enter and we are now in my favorite company directory. Let's list our contents. So now we have our accounting, human resources, marketing, and our sales folder. Now let's say you know you, you don't know where you're at within your terminal session. Uh, there is a popular command that you can use that is basically a way to show where you're currently at, and that is the print working directory, so PWD. So right now I am in my home directory, and then I'm in grant, desktop, my favorite company let's go ahead and go into the human resources folder. So CD human, let's try through first two words, and tab completion. Let's perform an LS and you can see all of uh, these text documents. Now let's say you want to see what the contents of a particular file are. To do this you perform a cat command. So do cat and we're going to use dwight.txt. And as you can see, we have our, they will show the contents of the file. So in the contents of the, the Dwight.txt, we have assistant to the regional manager. Let's go ahead and clear this current session. We aren't going to lose our location, but we are clearing everything. So to do that, all we have to do is just clear, and we are still in our current location. Now another command that you will commonly use is the echo command. And you can use the echo with an argument which displays the argument to the screen. So for instance, let's go ahead and click, let's go ahead and type echo Dwight and close. And as you can see, we are given our text here, our echo. Basically it's a print statement. It prints what is supplied to the screen. To create a new file within this directory, we can use the touch command. So if we t type in touch, and let's say we do packer.txt, we have a new file with a, perf we will perform an ls, and as you can see, we have a new file called Bro, you're teaching Linux and you you know how to find a freaking file. It took me like five minutes to find this file. Oh, there it is. Packer.txt. So we have created a new file. And let's just show the contents of this by using cats. Packer.txt. And there is nothing in this text file. To exit the command line, there are multiple ways you can do this, but I like to just simply use the exit command. So if you just type in exit, you will close your shell session. So these are a few of the common commands that you will use on a daily basis. So getting used to these is going to help you and really benefit you uh, in the long run because, well, you'll be using these a lot. There are a few ways to learn more about a command. You have the man page, which stands for a manual page, and you also have the help pages for the commands which exist as shell built-ins. To find out if a command is a shell built-in, use the type command dash A and type in the command that you're trying to find help for. So for instance, ls. So ls is in bin ls. And let's say we want to find one that is a shell built-in. You also have echo, for instance, is a shell built-in. So if you are looking for help with a shell built-in, you can simply use the help echo, and you will find a simple help page which you can read through. Now, if a help page does not exist because the command is not a shell built-in, 
you can use the man page. So type in man ls. I'm going to quickly hit Q to quit. For shell built-ins, you can also use the man page to learn more about the command as well. You have an option for shell built-ins. Uh, you can either choose the man page or the help page. Usually the man page is going to be a little bit longer. So going back to the LS page, this is our man page. We are given the name and a short description followed by all of the different options that we can use. To move down a line, all you have to do is press enter. To move down one page, go down space. To move to the top of the page is just G. To move to the bottom of the page is capital G. And to quit is Q. You can also use the arrows. Here we can learn more about what we can do with the ls command and the options that we can supply. When it comes to a command that you don't know, the man page or the help command is going to be your best friend. Uh, technically speaking, you could teach yourself Linux through the man page and the help commands, but um, might as well follow along with someone who kind of already knows the basis of the commands. Directories are simple containers for files and other directories. These provide a tree-like structure for organizing the system. So here are a few of the most common directory commands. Starting with the CD, as we have learned before, it means change directory. We can use the CD space period to represent this directory, so the current directory we are in. For instance, if we navigate to the desktop directory, type in CD space period, it represents this directory. As we have also learned, we can use cd space dot dot to go back one directory, and back to the parent directory. So now we are back to my home directory. Now, as we have also learned before, the parent child directory hierarchical structure, um, the backslash represents a separator of the directories. So this is a directory and then a separator and then you have my favorite company and it can continue down the line. Some other commands to navigate back to the parent directory, we can use the cd dash which will get us back one and also show us where we are at. And we also have the ability to do this by just using simply the CD. So we have three ways to go back to the parent directory. To make a new directory, type make dir and then the directory name. You can make multiple directories with a space. So for instance, let's say we want to create two directories, one called Angela and the next called Cat. Press enter and perform an ls listing option. You will see we have two new directories. So you can make as many directories as you want as long as you have that space separator. To remove a directory, we can simply type rmdir and the directory name. So let's say we want to get rid of cat. We can just do that, perform an ls command, and we have both the Angela and then we have a text document. Let's create a new file called cat.txt. And let's also create a new file or new directory in the Angela folder. Let's list our contents. So we have cats and we have a cats text document. Now let's say we want to remove the entire contents from this folder. To do this, all we have to do is 
type in rm for remove dash rf and our directory name, so Angela. Actually, before we do that, we have to go back one. Then we can do rm dash rf and Angela. And now if we perform an ls option, all we have is Kevin's secret chili recipe. Let's go ahead and navigate all the way back to our home directory, first by, by typing clear and then by using cd, and that's it, and we'll go all the way back to our home directory. So here, those are just a few of the most common directory commands that you can use. There's all types of commands. Again, if you want some help on a command, uh, all you have to do is do type dash a cd, cd is a shell built-in, so then we can use the help command and we can read more about the options of the cd command. Let's learn a little bit more about the ls command or list directories. So ls shows the output of the file contents as we have learned. But let's learn a little bit more about the options that you can supply for the ls command. First, let's go to our desktop. Then my favorite company, perform an ls command, and then type in cd human resources. Perform an ls, and you will see all of our text documents. To include all files, including all hidden files, we can create an ls-a option, which will allow us to see every single file. To list the files in a colorized format, you can use the ls-color option, and that will colorize it. It's basically, since there's no color, there's not going to be any um, organization. To get a long listing format, of uh, these text documents or any files within a directory, use the ls-l, and you will be using this one more commonly. And you can see that we have some of the permissions. We will go over this in one moment. To reverse the order of the listing content, we can do ls-r. Now everything's reversed in alphabetical order. To sort by time, we can use ls-t. So Packer, if you remember, was our most recent file that we created. Let's clear our screen. When we perform the long listing format with ls-l, you will see a long listing format, as we have highlighted. Now, you will use the long listing format for maybe multiple reasons. Maybe you want to know when it was created, or you want to know the owner or the group it belongs in. But usually, you're looking for the file permissions. And the file permissions are right here. So these are all the file permissions for each individual file. This is the number of links included. This is the owner of the file and the group it belongs, the, the group that the file belongs into. We have the file size, and we also have when the file was created along with our name for the file. Let's dive a little bit deeper into what these permissions mean when we perform a long listing format. File permissions are used to control who can read, write, and execute a given file or directory. So right here, we have been given the long listing of our files. And the default is dash rw dash rw dash r. The first dash represents the current file type. So when we have a just a regular dash, it is a regular file. If this was a directory, like down here, it would be D for directory. And L is used as a symbolic link. Now, as I've highlighted, there are three types of permissions that you can perform on files, which include read, or R, uh, write, which is W, and execute, which is X. 
So permissions on files are going to act as a read, write, or execute. With a read permission set, you are allowed to read the file. With a write permission set, you are allowed to write to the file. And with an X or an executable, you are allowed to execute the file. Now, there are three, as you can see, there's read, write, read, write, read. So what do these stand for? So for the first one, the RW dash stands for you, the user that you are currently. So that would be the user has read and write permissions, but not execute. The middle one is a group, the group that you belong into. And again, you belong into a group, so you have the read, write, and then you don't have the executable permissions. And any other ones that are not you or the group that you're in are set with read permissions. To find out which group you are in, simply use id-gn. And as you can see, grant, admin, cd-rom, so on and so forth. And just to clarify, these dashes mean that the permission is not set. So this person does not have executable permissions on any of these files. Now let's learn about how we can change these permissions on these files. And there's multiple ways, and I'm going to show you the easiest way to do this. To change file permissions, we will be using the chmod command, also known as change mode. So if we perform a type dash a chmod, we will see that chmod is not a shell built-in, so therefore we're going to use the man page. So the chmod man changes the file mode bits of each given file according to the mode. There are multiple ways you can change the file mode. We're going to start out with the letters way, the way that I like to call it, just a letter way. So let's go ahead and perform an ls-l. And let's change the permissions for Andy. So let's just do that ls-l andy.txt to pull up his particular ones. And you will see he has the default once. In order to change the file permissions, type in chmod and then followed by either the user group or uh, the other for so user u group g and o for other. And we can use the plus minus r equals to either add a permission, subtract it, or set all. And again, uh, R stands for read, W, write, and X, execute. So, for instance, let's change all of these to just read permissions. So what we're going to do is just do UGO equal R. So we're changing the user group and other to all, or on andy.txt. And if we perform an ls-l, you will see that Andy now only has read permissions for the user, for the uh, group, and for other. Now let's say we wanted to change his to all both read, write, and execute. Uh, we could simply change UGO equals read, write, execute, R, RXW. Uh, first, you would have to put in a file. Whoops. And if we do an ls-l, you will see now he has read, write, and execute permissions for all of his groups. So you can do this for any of the following files, um, and you should maybe practice this. So let's just do another ls-l, and let's change um, Michael. Let's go ahead and change his permissions. So to pull up his, do ls-l, and let's go ahead and add executable permissions for him, uh, the particular user. So once again, we just type in chmod u plus uh, x on Michael, and if we do a ls-l on him, he now has executable permissions on himself, basically. Now, let's say we wanted to take away the executable permission, all you do is do chmod u minus x, oops, minus x, michael.txt. And again, if we 
see his, we're back to the default permissions. So this is the letter way, and it's pretty easy. Basically, you just have to remember U for user, G for group, and O for other, or A for all, and then you just use the plus, minus, or equal sign to add or subtract or set all of the read, write, and executable permissions. Another way we can do this is in binary mode. Now, uh, binary mode means zero, means it's, it's off, and one means it's on, but we must, we must convert this to a base of 10. So I'm not gonna explain how exactly the binary mode works. I'm just gonna explain um, the most popular options um, that you will use when it comes to changing the mode with binary mode. Chamad 700, uh, and let's go ahead and do this on and the, uh, First, we will perform a chmod 700 on Andy. So if we do an ls-l on him, you will see that everything is set to off except him, uh, the owner. So he has read, write, and executable permissions. Chmod 755 is usually uh, the one that's you will use most commonly, and you're going to set that to read, write, and executable permissions for the owner, and only read and executable for the group and other. Chmod 664 allows you to have read, write permissions for the owner and the group but only read for other. Chmod 660 allows you to have read and write permissions for the owner and group and everything else is set to off. And for Chmod 644, we have read and write for the owner and only read for the group and other. Chmod 777 and 666 should be avoided. Chmod 777 gives read and write and execute permissions for all of the options. And Chmod 666 gives read and write for the group and owner and also the other. This is a way you can change your file permissions. You can either do it in the letter way or in the binary way. Now I have notes which are here, um, which explain the letter way and the binary way. So you can download this if you haven't downloaded it already to get a quick shortcut for the binary mode. And once you start using and practicing this, you will kind of just memorize these by heart. To find particular files and directories, we can use the find keyword. So right now I am in desktop, my favorite company, and human resources. Form an LS here to get uh, just a summary of what is in the contents of this directory. Now let's say we want to find a particular file. So let's say, um, I don't know where Aaron, it does even Aaron exist. You can use the find period dash name flag followed by a pattern. So we're gonna use Aaron.txt and Aaron.txt does exist in this directory. Let's say we wanted to find Aaron again, but we didn't want it to make it case sensitive. We didn't know if we capitalized it or lowercase. You can use the find period dash I name flag followed by Aaron.txt, for instance, and it's not case sensitive. You can combine the find option with 
uh, a dash ls flag, which will show each of the found files. So find period dash ls will show all of the found files. Let's say we wanted to find files which are a certain period of days old. We can use the find period dash m time followed by the day. So let's say we wanted seven days old and there are no files which are seven days old. To find files which are a specific number of size, we can use the size flag followed by a number, so zero. And these are all the files which have zero. Uh, they, they, there is no contents in these files. To find files which are newer than other files, type the find command followed by the newer flag. And let's say we want to do put in andy.txt. So all of the following files are newer than the andy.txt file. So these are just a few commands you can use when it comes to finding particular files. Like if you know a file is in a directory, but you don't know where it's at and you have a ton of documents, let's say, or text files, for instance, in one directory, you can use the find command. We know how to create a file and maybe we know how to view the contents of a file, but there are also additional commands that you can use to view files. And in addition to that, we can edit these files with some editors that are specific to Linux. So let's go ahead and start with the more commands with viewing a file. So as we learned from the very beginning, we can use the cat command to view a file. So if we use cat and type in dwight.txt, you will see the entire contents of this file. You only wanted to see, let's say, the first five or six lines. We can use the head command, followed by the file name, to just view the first few lines of a file. We also have the tail command, which will view the last few lines of a file. I believe it's 10 lines, if I'm correct. We can also use the more command, followed by the text name, to view the contents of a file. And you can use the spacebar to advance all the way down to the file. So basically, that's a way for you to kind of scroll through like a man page. You can also do less, followed by the file name. Oops. And this will simply go down as well. And that will end. And you can use Q to quit. Now, the cat command it does not update in real time. So let's say you have a log server that is logging specific actions that a user is performing. Um, you are not going to be able to cat that log server and view the real time events or the activities. Now, with tail and head, you can view the real time updates uh, to a file. So for instance, if this log server is recording something each minute, every single minute, you could use the tail or head followed by, let's say it's writing to a text document. Uh, you could use that. You could use the tail or head to um, go ahead and view the files in real time. So to view the files in real time, you can use the tail or head dash F option followed by the file name and this is what's going on in real time obviously there is nothing being appended there are multiple editors that you can use and choose from when it comes to creating and editing files the well-known editors in linux are nano vi or vim for the improved version and emacs so let's go ahead and start out with nano to edit a file in nano all we have to do is type nano followed by the file name. So here is a file that was already made for us, and here are some of the lines that the text file had had already. Let's say we wanted to append a new line here, and we wrote root beats. 
to save our changes, simply hit Control and the O, click Enter, and the new changes will be written to the file. If you wanted to get help on the Nano Editor, basically here are your commands that you can do with Nano, but if you wanted to get additional help, press Control G, you can scroll down to understand how to use Nano a little bit better. Most often, Nano is used to write one or two or just do basic, very basic operations. When it comes to appending lines or when it comes to appending lines of text and you can do simple tasks. Think of Nano as like um, Notepad. So to exit, all we have to do is press Control X and we are out. If we wanted to create a new file with the Nano Editor, simply write Nano followed by the name. So let's do mose.txt. And then if you wanted to save the file, let's just write hi, press Control O, enter X to exit out of it and clear the screen. And let's just perform an LS on mose. Oops. And here is the mose file. So we have created a new file with Nano. The next editor that we will be using is VI. There is also an improved editor to VI now called Vim. Uh, Vim is the one I recommend that you use, but Vim is not installed currently on this Ubuntu install. So if we do VI followed by our text document, you will see that it's a little bit different than Nano. Scroll all the way down, for instance, and let's say we wanted to uh, append a line here. We type in I followed by what we would want to append. So let's say uh, we wanted to append Grant. Then we could press the escape button followed by the colon. So just so we hit escape, then shift colon. Then we write WQ. So W stands for right, Q stands for quit. And let's say we wanted to see the contents of this file. You will see that grant has been added. Now, I recommend that you uh, look, if you're looking to really get, dive deep into the VI or Vim editor, I recommend a course by Jason Cannon that um, gives you basically the complete overview of Vim and how powerful it is. It's a super powerful text editor. Uh, I'm not going to be going into that in this little crash course. Ultimately, I just want to give you the options you have. Nano, you have VI or Vim, and you have Emacs. Uh, Emacs is not, also is very similar to Vim, and it's also not installed. So we're just gonna we're just gonna keep it simple, and um, we're just gonna have Nano as our only editor for now. Again, if you're looking to get a little bit deeper into Emacs or Nano, there is notes that I have provided that if if you've not downloaded them already. We know how to manipulate and maybe create some new files. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about that Use with deleting, copying, moving, and renaming files. We will start with renaming the files. So I have navigated to the desktop, my favorite company, and the sales folder. Let's go ahead and perform an ls and create a new file called Dwight was here.txt form another ls and you will see that we have this file. To remove this file, we simply type rm followed by the file name. I use tab completion, press enter, and you will see that it restores our original result. Let's create a new directory called Dwight was here. Form an ls and you will see we have a new directory created. To remove the directory, we can either do rm-r with the, dir the directory name, and that will delete the directory and all of its contents inside the directory. Or we can just do simply rm-dir followed by the name, and it will remove our directory. Let's navigate to our Q1 folder. 
Roman LS, and you will see we have a sales number.txt. Just to get a premise behind what is in this file, let's just perform a simple cat. So let's say we wanted to copy the sales numbers.txt. To do this, all we need to do is do cp followed by the name of the file and then the name of the new file. So I'm going to call this sn.txt. And if you perform an ls, you can see that we have the sales number.txt and the sn.txt. And I catted the contents or viewed the contents of sn, and it's the same as the sales numbers.txt. Let's go back a folder. Perform an ls. Let's say we wanted to copy the Q4 directory. To copy, all we have to do is type cp dash r followed by the copy we want to copy, or the directory we want to copy, and then the name of the new directory. Perform an ls, you can see that we have Q5. Change into the Q5 folder, and we have the same contents as what the Q4 folder had. Go back a directory. Let's look at our contents. And let's go back into the Q1 folder. So we have sn.txt and salesnumbers.txt. Let's create a new file back into the sales directory. So let's just do a dwight.txt file here. Now, if we wanted to move the dwight.txt to Q5, we would type mv followed by the source, so dwight.txt, to the destination, which would be Q5. If we perform an ls, as you can see, we no longer will have dwight here. If we change into our Q5 directory, ls, we have the dwight.txt file here. So you can use the MV to uh, move a file from its source to a destination. And finally, to rename a file, we can also use the MV command. So right now we have dwight.txt and salesnumbers.txt. To, let's say, rename the dwight.txt file, all we need to do is type mv followed by his original, and let's try dwight.txt. Do an ls. As you can see, it replaces the dwight.txt, or yes, the dwight.txt with dwightshoot.txt. Now, you may be thinking, mv, that stands for move, and that, that's pretty common common sense, well, how does this work? Well, basically, we are taking the contents of this file and we're moving it, the contents of the original file name into a new file called dwightshroot.txt. So you're basically moving the contents from this file name to a new file name. If I explain that correctly, uh, yeah, let's just go with that if you understood what I just said right there. So these are some of the things that you can do when it comes to file manipulation, like deleting, copying, moving, and renaming files. Creating a collection of files to archive or compress can make these files easily transferable and also save space. To create a collection of files to archive, we are going to be using the tar command. I have navigated to my desktop, my favorite company, in the sales folder. If I perform a quick ls, you can see we have our quarters in directories. Let's say we wanted it to uh, archive q1. To do this, first we are going to perform a pwd, print working directory, to see where we are currently at. Then we are going to go ahead and press tar, followed by the dash c for create the archive, dash, and then followed by f to name the file. And then we are going to name our archive. I'm going to call this q1.tar and make sure to follow your file 
extension with a .tar extension. Finally, before we press enter, we have to uh, submit or we have to dedicate where the uh, .tar file will lo be located. To do this, that's why I put the print working directory. So type home, grant, desktop, my favorite company, sales. Press enter once you have specified the location. And press ls, you will see that we have a new tar file. Now let's go ahead and compress a few files. Let's navigate into the Q5 folder for form and ls to see what we have. Now I want to combine both of these files and compress them together uh, into a zip file. So do gzip followed by the both of the files and press enter. You will now see that we have zipped both of these files with a gzip. So we can use the tar and the gzip files to compress and archive files so that they can easily be transferable across different locations instead of having to individually move each file. When I was first learning Linux, it was quite hard for me to understand a common practice that they use in Linux called input and output redirection. It takes a little bit of time to understand how input and output redirection works, and um, there's many things that you can do with input and output redirection. Now, for the scope of this crash course, I will not be going into the very details of input and output redirection. I will be going over the very, very basics. Before we start with some input and output redirection, let's first understand the types of input and output, often abbreviated as I.O. In Linux, we have standard input, standard output, and standard error. Now, standard input is often abbreviated to STDIN for standard input, standard output is STDOUT for standard out, and standard error is abbreviated to STDERR. Standard input, output, and error also have a file descriptor which explicitly defines what we are using. Standard input has a file descriptor of zero, standard output has a file descriptor of one, and standard error has a file descriptor of two. Now, for those of you who are a little bit confused on what, what standard input means or standard output, let's quickly do a brief example. Standard input, let's just go ahead and type echo hello world. This is considered standard input because we are inputting, inputting data into the screen. Press enter. The hello world is considered standard output because it is displayed to our screen. So that is considered to be outputted to the screen. So every single day when you're interacting with a computer or a phone, you're constantly making standard input and standard output. In addition to standard input and output, we have standard error. For standard error, it is a uh, message that is outputted to the screen, which is like an error message. So for instance, let's do pwd-dd. This won't work. And as you can see, we're given a little error message followed by a usage statement. This is considered standard error. Understanding and distinguishing the differences between each of these three I.O. types is important to understand redirection. So let's quickly go into a little bit of redirection and what we can do with it. So why learn input and output redirection? Well, input and output redirection allows you to combine multiple commands together in one line, making it more efficient to use. Let me clear my screen. So let's give you an example of the efficiency of standard input, output, and standard error redirection. Let's say we have the statement, hello world. Okay, and we want to put the hello world statement into a file called hello world. 
Now we can do that by simply first creating a file. Maybe let's do it with nano and call it hello world.txt. We're gonna go in, we're gonna write hello world and then control O to save, control X to, to exit, enter and then control X. Now we can cat the contents of hello world.txt and you can see we have the standard output message of hello world. Now that's not too long, it doesn't take too long to do that, but there's a really quick and easy way to do this with input and output redirection. And this really hints and foreshadows at what you can do and the powerful features that you can do with input and output redirection. So let's take this example again. Echo, hello world. But instead of creating a new file, this time we are going to be using the greater than sign. The greater than sign redirects standard output to a file. So we're going to use echo hello world and we're going to put this into new hello world.txt. If we perform an ls, you will now see we have a new hello world.txt. So if we cat the contents of new hello world.txt, you can see hello world. So what we did in three lines, we did in basically one line with input or with, uh, with, with standard output redirection. Okay, I want to add another statement to the hello world in the new hello world.txt file. To do this, what we will do is we will write echo followed by our next statement. So let's see, let's do hi. And if we want to add more contents to the existing contents, we will simply do a double greater than sign. So this redirects standard output to a file, but appends to any existing content. Write our new file here. And if we perform a cat on the new hello world, you will see now we have hello world and then we have a high line. We also have a redirection of input from a command to a file, and this would be the less than sign. The less than sign was something that I was very confused on and still kind of confused on to this day and how you specifically use it. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up a quick example here that I'm using. We are going to be redirecting standard input using the input redirection operator. We're just gonna be using this simple they, in this example, they use wc for word count. So if we perform a wc on new hello world.txt, this is how many lines exist, how many words exist, and the bytes, the total bytes. We can use wc followed by the less than sign than the new hello world. As you can see now, we have the bytes or the binary here, or we have the numbers here, but we no longer have the file name. This is because the WC command does not know the name of the file, the file. It only that it received is the stream of bytes. So the only thing that's received is the stream of bytes right here. Just a few moments ago, we talked about file descriptors. Why would we use file descriptors? File descriptors are used to explicitly define what we are trying to do. And file descriptors are specifically useful for when we want to direct standard error to a file. So let's say we have pwd um, dash dd, and we know this is going to populate an error message. Now let's say we want to put this uh, message into a error file so that we can see all of our errors in just one specific file. To do this, we will use a file descriptor. And the file descriptor for standard error is two. So we want to create a new standard error file and append any error messages. So we will use the greater than sign. Let's type our name error.err and press enter. Now if we cat the contents of error.err, you will see we have our error message here, followed by the usage statement. 
File descriptors are used to explicitly define what is happening, so if you wanted to redirect standard error instead of just standard output, you could use a 2. Or if you wanted to um, redirect standard output to a file, you could use 1 greater than sign. Finally, to wrap things up, again, we're doing a very introduction of, again, we are doing a very, very basic introduction of input and output. I'm going to show you the trash can. So the trash can is used to um, get rid of any contents that you don't want. So for instance, let's say you wanted to get rid of the error messages of pwd.dd. And you don't want to see them, you don't want to deal with these, these error messages. What we can use is a file or a directory location called dev null, and this acts as a location. So if we do pwd-dd dev null, you will see that we have our uh, error message populated here, and that error message will go to the dev null directory. So it redirects output to a trash can. Again, a very basic, very basic overview of input and output redirection. Um, we can use these three things together, combine these three things together to really make some, some um, really powerful uh, commands in one line so we, we don't have to continue to do a ton of steps. We can use the grep command to find text within a file. So the grep finds different patterns within a file. I have located to desktop, my favorite company, human resources. Form an LS very quickly. And we are going to be performing some, uh, some file patterns in the dwight.txt file. So let's go ahead and type in grep followed by the pattern that we want to see or search by. I'm going to use shoot for now, and we type in the file name. And as you can see, we have two occurrences. So it's pretty easy to use grep when you're trying to find, let's say you have a huge file and you're trying to find the specific lines that contain a specific syntax or command, you can use the grep command for pattern matching. If we use the grep-v and we type in shroot, followed by the pattern names. You will see all of the lines that do not contain the shoot line. So all of these lines are the ones. So dash the dash V option uh, inverts the match, meaning it it's it shows, displays the output of the files that do not match the pattern. If you want to ignore the case when performing a pattern matching, you can use the dash I option. To do this, basically, right, put in rep dash I followed by the search pattern and the file name. As you can see, we started the sentence with a capital S and it gives us the lowercase s's. If you want to count the number of occurrences within a file, you can use the dash C option. So dat grep dash C root. We have two occurrences, as you can see, one, two. So the dash C gives you the count, uh, the number of occurrences within a file. And finally, if we want to have the line numbers, the specific location where a uh, pattern is at, we can use the grep n option. -n As you can see, we have three. On line three is shroot, and on line 13 is shroot's beats. So grep can be used for pattern matching, and it is very useful when you're trying to look for patterns or specific lines within a file or script. Let's go back to our favorite subject, which is redirection. 
So the pipe is also another way we can redirect standard output from the preceding command and pass it in as standard input into the following command. You will be using pipes very often. So if the first command displays an error messages, those will not be passed to the second command. And you can also make a chain of pipes. You can have multiple pipes within one line. Here's an example. We have navigated to desktop, my work company, and human resources. Let's say we wanted to cat the files of Dwight, and we wanted to find a pattern of Schrute within these file, within the Dwight file. You would do grep, my pattern, grep Schrute. When we hit enter, we have displayed the contents, and we've only displayed the contents of the Schrute shrewd pattern. So a pipe basically takes the outputs of this and redirects it as standard inputs to this. Okay, let's do another example with multiple pipes. Let's take the contents of the Dwight text file. Let's find the first occurrence of the Dwight text file and print that to the screen. To do this, first let's cap the contents of Dwight.txt. We're going to add a pipe, followed by grep, and followed by the shroot pattern match that we're looking for. And let's take the first occurrence by using head-1. So we're getting the first occurrence of the shroot pattern. There you go. That is the first occurrence of the shroot pattern. And if we wanted to do a little bit more, let's say we wanted to find the, the line number that this is on, we can use the dash n option followed by the shroot. And as you can see, we have three. So instead of having to first look at the contents of Dwight.txt or just do a grep and then, you know, head like so it, it basically we're, we're combining multiple commands together to get one specific output if i explain that at all that makes sense to you um so yeah th this is this is a very powerful thing that you can do think of the pipe as almost like a greater than sign so it redirects the standard output as a standard input into a, another command or file very e easy to use but also very powerful Environment variables are storage locations that have a name and a value. Let's create a quick environment variable. So to create a environment variable, all we have to do is type in our variable name, followed by the contents of what is going to be inside this variable. Let's take a very basic example. TZ equals US. To see the contents of this environment variable, all we have to do is perform an echo, followed by dollar sign TZ. And as you can see, US, the contents of TZ, have been shown to our screen. So it's really easy to use environment variables and to create environment variables. There is some default environment variables. For instance, let's look at UID. This is a default environment variable. My UID right now is 1000. UID stands for user ID. You can also do, there's several types of default environment variables like this PID process ID doesn't have anything because right now I'm not running any process. So there is various different types of environment variables that are default that come um, or are explicitly defined in Linux. And then you can also create your own environment variables. If you were creating, uh, this is a stupid example, but if let's say you were creating a file that had echo hello world. And this file was constantly creating echo hello world, like you constantly had to do this command. Instead of doing this um, command each time, 
you could write an environment variable which would do which would store this contents of this file so hw hello world and then if we call the contents of hw you will see hello world so therefore we don't have to continually repeat the same statement Environment variables are really going to come in handy when we learn or when you learn about um, shell scripting. Shell scripting, these become in very much so handy. Process control can be used to view the current processes that are going on uh, in your Linux system. I have navigated to the desktop, my favorite company, and human resources. It won't necessarily matter. So uh, let's just perform a PS. This is going to show us our process status. As you can see, we have bash and we have ps. So these are the processes that are running. The PID is, stands for process ID. PS-E displays everything that is going on right now. So you'll see everything that's going on. And uh, these are the process IDs. So once again, you can see a particular process with its process ID. These are the processes. PS-F is used to show the full format listing. So now I have both my UID, PID, PPID, and it's just the full listing format for process ID, for the process command rather. PS-U grant will also display the contents of um, the processes that are running under the username grant, so all of these. Alrighty, let's look up um, PS P followed by 1913. We can look up a specific process and what's going on with the dash p option followed by the uid the pid rather so we have 1913 and we look up the process of 1913 with the dash p option ps dash ef will also show all of the processes but this will show processes for the root accounts and like the grant account, it will show all of the processes that are going on. PS dash E capital H shows us the processes going on in a tree format. So here is the parent, child, child of this. It, it just keeps going down. It's, it's a tree. PS dash E dash dash for est. We can also use the top command, which is an interactive uh, process viewer. So this is in real time. As you can see, contents are being updated. So when, when you're going to use PS, you're going to use it for when you're trying to see if a particular executable or something is working within your Linux system, you could find the process ID or the PID and then you can query that with a search uh, using the PS-P option and you can get more information about the contents um, and this interactive mode you can see like what how much of the CPU is being used, the memory, and ETC. Another really powerful thing that you can do in Linux is create and switch users from the terminal. One way to switch a user is to use the SU name. Right now I am using the grant user, the default user. You can use the who am I command to look up the current user that you are. And let's say that I wanted to switch this user uh, from grant to eroot because I wanted to do some configurations. You can use the SU for switch user followed by the username. Type in the root password and you are now under the root account. 
you can see that you are roots because you have the hashtag instead of the dollar sign. Let's switch back to the regular account. You can also use the sudo command to execute a command like another user, but you don't need to know the password for that user. Um, this is one of the security features in a way that you can uh, that, that Linux provides. You don't have to switch into the root account, which is um, going to be less secure than if you were just to run one specific command with the sudo. So you can use the sudo-l to find the list of commands, the list of available commands. And you can use the sudo followed by the command to run a particular command in sudo. To create a new user, you can simply use the user add command. So let's create a new user. And we will make this Michael. Now, as you can see, it is denied because we have to use sudo. So these are just a few of the things that you can do with switching and creating new users. When you install software on a Linux system, you do so with a package. A package is a collection of files that you make uh, an application. So package managers manage dependencies. Installing software is a little bit different depending on the distribution of the OS you are using. So for using the software on Debian and Ubuntu, we use the apt-get command to get a specific package. Now let's say we want to look for a particular package but we don't know necessarily what that is exactly. We can use the apt cache followed by the search command and the search string. Um, so so I looked up a new package called Terminator, and here are some of the, th of the packages that we can download with Terminator. All we have to do is do apt git install. Make sure to run, make sure to run with sudo or root privileges. The package has now completely installed. To remove a package, we can use the apt-get remove or the apt-get search. So sudo apt-get remove terminator. And we can now remove the package. For CentOS, Fedora, and Red Hat distributions, the process install is a little bit different. We use the yum command instead of the apt-get command. We can use the yum search, and then we can look for the terminator program. And as you can see, there were no matches found. Now, let's say we wanted to install a package. All we would have to do is use yum install followed by the package name. To remove a package, we would only have to use the yum remove and remove the package name here. And we can get more info about a specific package that we installed using yum info. So installing software is very easy, whether you are on a CentOS-like distribution or Ubuntu. And it's usually, typically speaking, even a little bit easier than just using a graphical interface, because all you have to do is type in one command, as long as you know what you're trying to install. Okay, so this is it for the crash course portion in terms of learning the terminal and getting some basic overview of how you navigate the terminal. 
One of my projects that I completed in the, uh, the introduction project was working with IP tables. I gave myself a scenario where I was going to create a web server and um, basically create uh, IP table rules or firewall rules so that I could allow certain ports to be blocked and certain ports would be granted or allowed. I will walk through this project now. Um, know that IP tables is pretty easy to use and it was a pretty easy project. So let's get to IP tables. For this project, we will be working with IP tables. IP tables is a Linux firewall and firewalls control network access. The Linux firewall is comprised of NetFilter plus IP tables. NetFilter is a kernel framework and IP tables is a packet selection system. We can use the IP tables command to control the firewall. IP tables is comprised of tables, chains, and rules. There are five default tables in IP tables. We have the filter, NAT, network address, translation, mangle, raw, and security. The filter is the most commonly used default table. There are five default chains, input, output, forward, pre-routing, and post-routing. Pre-routing allows altering of packets before sending to the input chain. Post-routing allows altering of packets before they exit the output chain. Rules in IP tables can be applied through doing a match plus adding a target. You can match on a protocol, a source or destination IP or network, a source or destination port, or a particular MAC address. There are five default targets, except drop, which will not notify the sender that the packet was rejected, reject, log, and return. IP tables handles IPv4 and IP6 tables handles IPv6. Before we get started with configuring our basic web server setup, let's go ahead and learn a little bit about how to work with IP tables. I have opened up a new terminal session, and because we are going to be configuring IP tables, which requires root privileges, I'm going to briefly switch over to the root account. <clears throat> I am now at my root account. And now I can manipulate, create new rules, delete rules uh, for the IP tables. To display the filter table, the, the table that we will be working with, we have to type IP tables followed by the flag dash capital L. And as you can see, these are our three chains, input, forward, and output. Input means packets coming into your system. Output means the chain is used for go outgoing packets, and forward is used if you want to allow um, NAT rules or you want to filter traffic based off of NAT. So this is what we will be working with, and we will be using the IP tables-l every single time we create a new rule. Now up here we have a policy except for all three, which is the default. And we can change the policy with IP tables dash P. The IP tables dash P command will change the policy once we specify the specific chain. For instance, let's go ahead and add for the input chain and let's put drop. And if we perform an IP tables dash L, you will see we now have the policy as drop which drops all incoming packets by default. To add a new rule to a chain, we can either do the IP tables dash I to insert into a specific chain. So for instance, input the input chain. We can use the dash A flag when we want to append a new rule to a specific chain. And we can use the dash D flag when we want to delete a rule. We can specify rules based off of the source, the destination IP addresses, the protocol, and even some of the modules. So we're not gonna dive into the dash M option, but um, 
for creating a rules, all we have to do is to IP tables dash A or I, followed by the input chain dash P to specify a port, dash dash D port for designation port, and dash J is the target. So in this example, we are adding a new rule to the input chain based off of the protocol TCP, the destination port 22, which is SSH, and we're dropping all SSH connections or attempts. By default, all IP table rules reset when the Linux system has reset. So to save the rules, we can use the apt get install IP tables dash persistent. We can use this command to install IP tables uh, persistent, which will allow us to have our rules on our uh, save at every single time the Linux system is reset. To flush all rules, we can use IP tables dash F, and that will flush all of our rules. So it will make everything back to the default except the policies. I'm going to change my policy from uh, drop to accept. Let's go ahead and start our basic web server setup. We will be creating specific rules based off of the port, protocol, or IP address. You will learn a little bit more about how to create rules here. Uh, I didn't do a great explanation at first, but you'll learn a little bit more here. So let's go ahead and get started. Here I have IP tables dash L and I did set my policy back to accept. Let's go ahead and start with SSH traffic. To get the IP address of our machine, specifically for Ubuntu, we can use IP ADDR. And you will see our IP address is right here. Let's go ahead and add our first rule into the input chain because this is going to be an in this is going to be an incoming packet or incoming SSH connection. So we did an a, a IP ADDR and we found our IP address. So let's start with IP tables dash I to insert into the input chain. We are going to be using the port TCP or protocol rather and the destination port for this is SSH which is port 22. The source port is going to be this IP address right here. So it would be 10 dot 10.0.2.15 for me specifically. And finally, we just have to add our target, which is going to be accepting this connection. Now, if we perform an IP tables dash L, you will see we have our first rule and you can see the specific protocol and port we are using. You may have an IP address that's populated here. For me, it just automatically populates my uh, host name or the, the host name of this virtual machine, which is Grant Virtual Box. Now let's go ahead and add our web server rules, which would be um, HTTP and HTTPS. For HTTP, we would add our uh, IP tables dash A for appending a new rule. And we're going to add it to our input chain, dash P for the port, TCP, dash, dash D port, 80 for HTTP. And we're going to add our target, which is accept. Now we have two rules. We have our SSH and we have our HTTP. Let's go ahead and do HTTPS real quick. So IP tables dash A to append back into the input chain for the protocol TCP dash dash D port 443 dash J accept. And if we perform an IP tables dash L, 
we have our three rules here. Now, for the scope of this little web server, we are not going to be enabling FTP or file transfer protocol, but if you were to want, wanting to uh, enable FTP, I will link a blog post down below. All you have to do is perform these three commands. You have to enable port 20, 21, and then you have to add this extra command here. Let's allow DNS traffic in addition to our three rules. To do this, we will be enabling both the TCP and UDP. So let's go ahead and add our chain. We are appending back into the input chain, dash P for TCP port 53, because that is uh, t the TCP port number for DNS, dash J accept. Let's add our, I did an up arrow, followed by UDP, which is also port 50. Three. Now, if we perform an IT tables dash L, you will see we have our two new rules. So this is our basic web server setup, and it gets a lot more complex than this. Um, for some reason during my project, and even now, uh, you would usually set the default policy to drop to drop all incoming packets but for some reason it wouldn't work when I was testing the connection. So I'm just allowing this to accept, but know that this isn't the secure way. This is a basic way that we can do to set up the um, web server and really IP tables is very easy to work with. I am going to leave a the basic web server um, uh, blog that I kind of followed along with, as well as the notes for IP tables, which you can download so that you can learn a little bit more about IP tables and gain a thorough understanding. That was it for this project. It was a very basic project and it didn't take much to do. And I learned a little bit more about how firewalls work within Linux. Coffee is almost done. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed today's crash course. Um, if you guys want to see more of this, let me know. It took me a while to build and create, but I think it's a, a good way for me to learn and reiterate what I've learned. And also give you guys a, a chance to learn for free and to also see the kind of projects that I do. The project in this was really easy. So until the next time, continue to practice and uh, yeah. Have a good day.